So we're just going to let um, a few more people come into the webinar and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just give it another minute or so, just a few more people coming in. Okay, so... Um, numbers have stabilized in terms of participants um, so I think it's a good time to make a start. Um, so good afternoon everyone, my name is Emma Congree, I'm Deputy Director here at the Fraser Valander Institute and um, it's great to see so many people on the call today and apologies to those who were hoping to see us in person and um, it just a variety of factors meant that it just wasn't really going to work out too well to do the in-person event and we already had a lot of people um, signed up online so um, I think we made the best decision and the best event we can do we believe today will be an online one but we very much hope to have an event in the new year where we can take stock of what's announced in the budget and um, hopefully get together then. Um, so I'm going to um, to say a little bit about the Fraser Valander Institute and then I will introduce our speakers. Um, so the Fraser Valander Institute is an independent economic research institute based at the University of Strathclyde. And one of the key things that we look at each and every year is what's going on um, with the Scottish budget. Uh, and today um, I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Hughes, who's chair of the Office of Budget Responsibility um, and Russell Gunson from the Robertson Trust. And um, today we're gonna to give a bit of a background to what's going on in the UK, UK economy um, and what's happened uh, recently there. We will then look at what's going on in the Scottish economy and um, talk about some of the, um, the findings from our pre-budget report that we released yesterday. Well, it already feels like a long time ago, but it was yesterday, um, which was looking ahead to see some of the announcements that be on Thursday. And then it's really great we have Russell here, who will talk a bit about some of the work that the Robertson Trust have been looking at, particularly in relation to low-income households and some of the um, policy issues that affect them and what some of the options are open to the Interim Finance Secretary come Thursday and potentially beyond. Um, so uh, I hope everyone is able to see the slides and I'm going to hand straight over to Richard for um, his part of the presentation. Um, we will have questions and answers at, right at the end after all three have spoken. So and um, please use the Q&A box um, to add questions whenever you like. Um, so Richard. Great. Thank you very much, Emma. And it's very nice to join you uh, virtually on this occasion and uh, uh, likewise hope to join you in person uh, on a future occasion. Um, uh, I was going to take you through the highlights of our forecast, which we published on the 17th of November to inform the Chancellor's autumn statements. And I should say, um, when we get to the q and I'll be joined by my colleagues, Andy King and David Miles, who are with me on the OBR's Budget Responsibility Committee. So. Um, uh, and so any questions you have on, on, on this forecast, we'd be very happy to, um, to try to answer. Um, this is the first time we published a forecast uh, since March of this year, when we did a forecast supporting uh, then Chancellor Rishi Sunak's um, March budget. And, and a lot has changed in the intervening eight months. And let me start my presentation with three important economic and fiscal developments in March, which explain most of the changes uh, to the e to the economic and fiscal outlook since our last forecast. The most important economic development since our last forecast you can see on this chart, which has been the deepening of the European energy crisis precipitated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine back in February. 
Um, and in particular, over the summer, the further reduction in Russian gas imports, which you can see as the red part of the, uh, uh, of the graph on the left, uh, looking at Europe, EU and UK gas imports by source over the course of this calendar year, since our last forecast has sort of further choked off Europe's uh, gas supply. Um, and that's led to uh, that combined with a rush to fill up gas storage before the winter arrived, and also the damaging of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline uh, drove wholesale European gas prices up um, to, to even greater heights over the summer, which you can see in the charts on the right. Um, the green line is the gas price that we used in our March forecast. Um, the blue line uh, uh, is, the, is, the, is the gas price that we use in our November forecast. And the yellow line shows the peak that the price reached in, in late September um, at, at the height of, of disruptions uh, to, to European gas markets. Um, and, and, and what it shows is that uh, we, we use for the gas price assumptions in our forecast, the futures curves um, at, a, at a, around the end of October was when we closed our forecasts. And based on, based on those futures prices, gas prices are expected to reach a peak of around £3.70 per therm um, in early 2023. That's roughly double the level assumed in our March forecast over the course of that year. Um, prices do then fall back, as you can see on the chart, um, to around £1.90 per therm by the time we get to the mid-2020s. But that's still four times higher um, than the around 50p per therm that we used to pay for gas at, at the times during the pandemic. So um, in the medium term, gas prices do fall back, but they are still much higher um, than we were than we, we had gotten used to um, in, in over the last decade or so. Now, obviously, the government's energy price guarantee limits the average increase in household energy bills to £2,500 this winter and £3,000 next winter. So to some extent, households are insulated from what would have been even larger increases in their energy bills. And there's a scheme, similar scheme in place for firms um, at least up until March of next year. However, these schemes, uh, these schemes expire, and so they don't change the price of energy that, the, that households and businesses are facing over the medium term. And so sustained higher energy prices do act as a drag on productivity and potential output, um, which is something which we had explored in our fiscal risks report over the summer, and has sort of come to pass in this forecast in ways in which you'll see um, as I go through the presentation. Um, uh, as, as these inflationary pressures have built up, um, the, other, the other major development since March um, has been that market expectations for interest rates have risen. And you can see on the left, uh, the market interest rates for uh, the Bank of England's policy rate. Uh, back in March, we were forecasting a peak of around 2%, shown in green. Um, and uh, they are based on the print of the curve that we use in our forecast, shown in blue, they now peak at around 5%. Um, uh, in, in the early part of next year. Um, and as you can see from the chart on the right, longer term interest rates on UK government debt have also risen dramatically and are now two to three times higher um, than we expected back in March. And the guilt rate curves that we used in our fiscal forecast, um, which are shown in blue in the chart on the right, uh, were taken in the 10 working, in the sort of first 10 working days of Rishi Sunak's prime ministership, which started on the 24th of October. Um, and they see yields peak at just under 4% at the 20 year mark. As you can see from the yellow lines, interest rates uh, did rise even higher than that um, during, during the, the sort of peak of the market convulsions that followed Kwasi Kwarteng's growth plan on the 23rd of September, which saw 20-year gilt yields rise to 4.5% the following working day. Um, and while some of that late September spike in yields reflected an increase in the interest rate differential between the UK and other sovereigns, that increase in spreads between the UK and the rest of the world had all but disappeared by the time we closed our fiscal forecast. So the higher interest rates baked into our forecasts from here on in really reflect developments in global interest rates, um, those that are happening in the US, those that are happening in Germany, rather than any UK specific factors, which while they, while they were evident in late September, um, had more or less disappeared from the data by the time we prepared our economic and, and fiscal forecast. Um, in addition to these largely external influences, fiscal policy here at home has also been a key source of uncertainty since our last forecast in March. And indeed, the past six months have witnessed a series of dramatic swings in the direction of fiscal policy with five major fiscal statements delivered by three successive governments. And this chart illustrates the cumulative effect of those statements on government borrowing over the next five years, starting with then Chancellor Rishi Sunak's 26th of May cost of living package, which added nine billion pounds to borrowing this financial year with savings in subsequent years from the new energy profits levy. But if we fast forward to the 8th of September and then Prime Minister Liz Truss's original energy price guarantee and equivalent support for businesses added a further 70 billion pounds to borrowing over the next two years. 
And to this near-term fiscal loosening, the personal and corporation tax cuts in Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng's 23rd of November growth plan would have added a further 48 billion pounds a year to borrowing over the medium term. But almost all these tax cuts were reversed uh, in Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's statement of the, of the 17th of October, with the main survivor being the ditching of the health and social care levy, which brought the net medium term fiscal loosening down to 21 billion pounds by 2027 28. And finally, uh, the autumn statement announced on the 17th of November delivered a further package of net tax rises and spending cuts, which reduced borrowing by 62 billion pounds in 2027 28. And taken together, that, that cumulative series of, of policy measures and including their indirect effects via the economy, the net impact of this series of announcements and reversals has been to add over 40 billion pounds to borrowing this year, but then take almost 40 billion pounds off borrowing by the time you get to 2027 28. And so those three big movements in energy markets, interest rates and government policy since March, all had big implications for the economic and fiscal outlook. And, and this slide shows, it starts with their implications uh, for inflation. We now expect inflation to peak at around 11% in the fourth quarter of this year, driven principally by higher global energy prices, but also higher food prices. That's two and a half percentage points higher at its peak than we forecast back in March, but the peak is two and a half percentage points lower and one quarter earlier than it would have been had the government not introduced the energy price guarantee. And that's illustrated, and, and the difference between uh, in what inflation would have been without the energy price guarantee is shown there in the dotted line, and then our actual forecast for inflation taking into account the effects of the energy price guarantee um, is shown in, in the solid black line. Inflation is then expected to fall back sharply over the course of next year, and it's dragged into negative territory in the middle of the decade before it returns to its 2% target by the end of the forecast period. But in the near term, inflation far outpaces growth in nominal wages. We can have the next slide. Um, uh, and because inflation outpaces nominal wages, uh, which are expected to grow by, uh, by, by around half the rate of inflation at around 6% this year and 4% next year, this drives historically large falls in per person real disposable incomes, which drop by a cumulative 7% over the next two financial years, and wipe out about eight years of worth of improvement in living standards that we've seen um, over, the over, the, over the preceding eight years. And this, this sharp fall in living standards happens despite the energy price guarantee and other government support, which raise real incomes by around 3.5% on average this year and next. However, for, for a net energy, energy importer like the UK, with a huge increase in global gas prices, um, this means there's an inevitable terms of trade shock that leaves our economy as a whole poorer. So while government policy can, through spending, taxation, and borrowing, as it, as it did in this autumn statement, also who, who in the UK pays these higher energy costs within and between generations, it can't make them go away. We're a net energy importer, and our cost of living as a, as a country as a whole has gone up um, compared to the resources that we can generate domestically. Indeed, we expect real incomes in 2027-28 to still be 1% below their pre-pandemic peak of three years ago. This squeeze on real household disposable incomes drags down consumption and it tips the economy into, recession, into a recession, which we expect to just to last for just over a year. Um, and we expect and, and, and this recession started in, in the last quarter, so we are we are already in the midst of it. Uh, peak to trough, real GDP, we expect to fall by just over 2%. Um, but it would have fallen by half as much again in the absence of the government support uh, that I mentioned. And this fallen output uh, is, is, is significant, but as you can see from the charts, it's much shallower than, than that which, which we experienced during the pandemic, and also smaller uh, than the fallen output you saw during the 2008 financial crisis, but similar in depth to that seen during the recession of the late 19, 1990s, or the early 1990s. Um, Higher energy costs, higher interest rates, uh, and higher corporate taxes also reduce business investment over the next few years, in addition to the squeeze on household consumption, and that has longer term implications for the level of, of potential output. And this weaker, this weaker outlook, combined with down revisions to outturn data over the past two years, mean that real GDP doesn't return to its pre-pandemic level until the end of 2024, and remains over 3% lower at the forecast horizon than when we expected back in March, showing the kind of longer term consequences of having to pay for higher energy over the medium term uh, for the UK economy as a whole. Let me now turn to the latest fiscal outlook, um, taking into account the more challenging economic backdrop over the next five years, and the net result of the array of fiscal policy announcements that we've seen over the past six months. And having fallen from its post-war peak of 15% of GDP at the height of the pandemic to below 6% of GDP last year, 
borrowing is set to rise again this year to just over 7% of GDP before falling back to just over 2% of GDP by 2027-28. In cash terms, government borrowing is nearly 80% higher, 80 billion pounds higher this year and almost 40 billion pounds higher in, the five, in five years time than we forecast back in March. And to understand what drives this deterioration in the fiscal position, this chart breaks down that increase in cash borrowing between our March forecast and now into first differences arising from underlying forecast changes, which are shown in this chart in blue. Second, changes that arise from the net effect of policy decisions, which are shown in red for spending and yellow for tax changes. And third, the indirect, the indirect or second round effects of those policy changes by their impact on the economy and the debt interest paid on new borrowing, which is shown in this chart on purple, in purple. Uh, starting with the blue bars on the chart, underlying forecasting changes add around 55 billion pounds on average to borrowing over the next five years. And three large changes dominate this. First one is higher interest rates adding to the government's debt servicing costs. The second is higher inflation and inactivity adding to welfare spending. And the third is, is a weaker economy, which weighs on tax receipts in particular as you get to the end of the forecast period. Turning to the effect of policy changes shown in, in red and yellow, the May and September cost of living and energy packages add around 60 billion pounds to spending this year and around 25 billion pounds of spending next year. But then when you look out over the medium term, cuts in departmental spending plans over the remaining three years of the forecast save around 30 billion pounds in the final year of the forecast, with three fifths coming from current budgets and two fifths coming from the capital budgets of UK government departments. And finally, tax changes cost money next year, but raise money in the final four years of the forecast, as the revenues lost from scrapping the health and social care levy are more than offset by increases in other taxes, with a net yield of around eight and a half billion pounds in the final year of the forecast. The indirect effects of all those policy changes via the economy reduce borrowing materially in the near term by supporting incomes and lowering inflation, but they raise borrowing modestly thereafter due to higher debt interest costs and the fiscal consolidation weighing on economic activity. And when you take all this together, these changes leave the level of borrowing around 85 billion pounds higher in the next two years and around 40 billion pounds higher in five years time. Where does all this leave the levels of taxation and expenditure in five years time? Well, the tax burden rises from 33% of GDP before the pandemic in 2019-20 to over 37% of GDP by the time we get to 2027-28, which is around one percentage points higher than we forecast back in March and its highest sustained level since just after the Second World War. This higher tax burden pays for a larger state, which you can see on the right, whose total expenditure rises from 39% of GDP before the pandemic to 47% of GDP this year, before falling back to 43% of GDP in five years time. And this leaves public spending around 3% of GDP larger than we forecast back in March. And again, it's highest sustained share since the late 1970s. This increase in the overall size of the state over the medium term is driven by a combination of higher inflation and interest rates, which push up the cost of the government's inflation index welfare commitments and the servicing of the government's higher stock of debt. And these increases, these increases more than offset the cuts of departmental budgets in the final three years of the forecast, which leaves overall government spending higher in cash terms, and more importantly, as a share of an economy which was made smaller by the energy price shock. Turning to what that implies for the stock of government debt, compared to our March forecast, headline, headline debt is now higher as a share of the economy in every year, and by 17% of GDP in the final year. If you include the net, of the, the, the net debt of the Bank of England, it rises from 97% of GDP last year to a peak of 107% of GDP in 2023-24, which would be its highest level in six decades, and then falls over the remaining four years of the forecast. But this path is somewhat distorted by the repayment of around 150 billion pounds of loans issued by the bank's term funding scheme. And so when you exclude the Bank of England from our debt figures, which you can see on the right, underlying debt, underlying debt still rises from 84% of GDP last year, to peak at just under 100% of GDP at 98% of GDP in 2025-26, and then falls modestly in the final two years of the forecast, meeting the government's objective to get debt falling um, by the fifth year of the forecast period. This higher stock of debt, coupled with much higher interest rates uh, than when we, when we did our last forecast in March, means that the share of public revenue that's now being consumed by interest payments has risen, has risen dramatically. We expect debt interest costs to rise from under 5% of revenues in 2019-20 to over 8.5% of government revenues by 2027-28, having spiked to a post-war high of 12% of government revenues this year. And it's not only the scale, but also the speed at which higher interest costs um, and inflation have pushed up debt servicing costs that's a warning to this in future chancellors. 
as we've underscored in, in successive reports on fiscal risks, both the government's higher stock of debt and also the shortening of the effective maturity of that debt as a result of the Bank of England's quantitative easing operations has significantly increased the sensitivity of the public finances to changing in borrowing costs since the start of the century. And to illustrate this heightened sensitivity of our public finances to changes in interest rates, every one percentage point rise in short-term interest rates now adds around 13 billion pounds to debt interest costs the following year, rather than just two billion pounds if we had the same debt level and debt structure as we had uh, 20 years ago um, at the turn of the century. And further rises in interest rates are just one of the risks to the economic and fiscal outlook. And this final slide summarizes some of the key upside and downside risks. Starting with the upside, the outlook would be clear, clearly brighter if there were to be a rapid end to Russia's war in Ukraine, which would stabilize European energy markets, reduce pressure on inflation and interest rates, um, and could also spur investment and productivity growth over, over the medium term and help the government to get debt falling faster than its current plan of getting it falling by the fifth year of our forecast. But should the Ukraine war last longer and higher energy prices and inflation persist, there are several downside risks to worry about. Firstly, energy re related support to households and businesses, much like the furlough scheme during the pandemic, could prove difficult to withdraw as their deadlines draw closer. Other supposedly one off measures, such as the temporary business rates relief for retail and leisure sectors and the household support fund, are now heading into their fourth years at a cost of over three billion pounds next year. And all those schemes were introduced as temporary measures designed to provide transitional relief. And inflation is also putting pressure on departmental spending. Eight and a half billion pounds was found in this autumn sort of statement to top up the health, social care, and schools budgets in 2024 25. But other departments still face a reduction in real terms in their spending power of between 5.3 and 15.3 billion pounds, depending on your choice of inflation index. And next April's planned superindexation of fuel duty is assumed to bring in 5.7 billion pounds in revenue next year, but it would require a rate increase of 23% in order to deliver the revenue that's already baked into our forecast. So with that as an overview of our forecast, um, but also the risks and uncertainties around it, I'll hand it back to you, Emma, and look forward to taking your questions along with my colleagues. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, that was a fascinating um, sprint through what's been happening over the last, um, last well, quite, quite a wee while, actually. Um, and we've already got some questions in for you, so we'll be coming back to those at the end. Um, but thank you very much, and um, we will speak again later on. So um, we're now going to move on to look through some of the um, the implications going on here in Scotland. Um, and apologies, you're having to make do with me today. Um, Murray, unfortunately, is unwell, so couldn't join us. Um, so you get me instead to talk us through what the outlook is for the Scottish economy, and then look into some of what we've been saying ahead of Thursday's budget. So um, if we just take a look at where we are in terms of the Scottish economy, Obviously, it's been a tumultuous few years, and there's not really an end in sight for some of that. Um, if we look at where GDP is, um, the latest data for Scotland um, shows that we are still a little below the pre-pandemic level. Like GDP gets revised quite a lot, so we do sometimes, yeah, these, these do move around a little bit, but this is the latest assessment of where we are. Um, so I've just shown here what the um, GDP levels and GDP growth rates are at the moment. Obviously, on Thursday, we'll have the set of forecasts from the um, Scottish Fiscal Commission, which will show their estimates of where this is going. And they will be the most up to date estimates available. Um, and we will follow suit come January with our next economic outlook, which will um, do the same. But for now, where we are is that we had very weak growth um, going into the second quarter of the year and then a contraction in GDP in Scotland in the third quarter. So we do believe we are at the start of a recession in Scotland. You know, we're no different from what's happening in the rest of the UK. The same factors are impacting on us here. Um, so we will have to wait and see um, what the figures are for next quarter, but we do think we will be in, in that technical recession come then. The labour market, so still, um, still defies expectations somewhat. So the latest figures were out today. Again, um, we've got employment continuing to rise. Um, 
we are a level you know, that we were seeing pre-pandemic for employment now as well. Um, but if we look at what's going with economic inactivity, and remember economic inactivity are people who, have, um, who are not looking for work um, for various reasons, uh, maybe ill health, which we've been hearing a lot about recently, and um, maybe other factors to do with being a student or looking after the home, or a variety of, of, of factors. And economic inactivity, it's on the on long term trends, it has it has been um, ticking up, but in the last quarter of data, we've had quite a drop. So it is quite a volatile series. So again, too early really to understand what's going on there fully. And if we look at unemployment, um, so if we're thinking about a weak economy, that does tend to translate um, usually to uh, an increase in the unemployment rate. And we have started to see a slight uptick there. Already too early to say whether that is the start of a trend, but certainly if unemployment has been just falling and falling for quite a long time now. So we are starting to see something a little bit different going on there. So we're potentially you know, at this point of the of the um, economic cycle where things aren't really in flux so very difficult for forecasts to be made at this point and um, so um yeah we'll, we'll see what the scottish fiscal commission have on thursday and it'll be really interesting to see um how they relate to the forecast the obr have made for the uk economy as well okay i'm going to now move on to talk uh, about the outlook for the budget so hopefully you've uh, seen our budget report from, um, which we published yesterday. And I'm just going to talk through some of the key themes. And indeed, there has been a little bit of um, speculation and announcements sort of coming out through the press of some things that we might see on Thursday. Um, but overall, we are going into this budget um, in a position where the, the events of the last year and that huge uptick in, in inflation has eroded the value of the Scottish budget for the, that financial year 2022-23. So, I mean, that has been really difficult for the Scottish government to manage. Of course, we've seen them having to um, cut back spending at, towards the end of, um, well, the second half of the financial year um, with the emergency budget review, looking to where cuts could be made to spending that was already um, expected. And that's been very much to try and, and make room for some of the, the pay settlements that have been going through. So um, still some way to go on some of those. Now, we are fairly clear that there has been that erosion in the value of the um, of the Scottish budget over 22-23. Um, but there can be a difference of opinion on how severe that cut has been. So these figures here, we are using something called the GDP deflator. So just a very quick aside onto what, um, what deflators um, you can use, and this is getting a little bit technical, but you may see some discussion of this over the next week. So usually when we're looking at deflating government expenditure, so taking account of inflation, we use the GDP deflator. It does a reasonable job usually of capturing the cost pressures faced by the government sector. So if we think about the, the economy, we have consumers, we have business, and we have government so broadly. And um, so when we're, we're trying to capture um, what the best sort of price measure is facing the government sector. So I say it usually does a very good job of that, but at the current time, high in consumer inflation, so consumer price inflation, is feeding through to pay demand. So the government in Scotland and the UK is, start, is feeling the effects of uh, high CPI inflation. Um, but if we were thinking about, or oh, maybe we could just deflate spending by CPI to get an estimate of the impact um, of inflation, that would probably be overstating things. Obviously, the government's not the same as a consumer. Um, it's not spending most of its money on um, eggs and bread and, and even energy so but its biggest um biggest expense really is is staff um and there has been pressure on those as i say because of high consumer price inflation but they are not increasing by 10 percent um all the pay settlements have been below that and um, so we're somewhere probably between the gdp deflator and um, and a measure of using uh, cpi inflation when we're 
when we're actually trying to understand the true impact of inflation on the Scottish government budget. Um, so we're somewhere in the middle of that, but we think somewhere in the region of about a billion pounds has, has been kind of eroded from the Scottish government budget this financial year. But moving ahead to next financial year and the one after, in fact, we actually, from what we know at the moment, and this is using the GDP data again, we think that the, the, the real terms impact on the, on the Scottish budget is going to be relatively flat. And that is because of the um, consequentials that have come through from the UK government as a result, largely of the autumn statement. So they um, had additional spending in 23, 24, 24, 25, which has resulted in, in uh, consequentials for Scotland. Um, and that has been enough to offset the expected impact of inflation in those years. We'll obviously have to wait and see what inflation actually turns out to be. But that's where we are at the moment. So um, it's quite a different situation than perhaps we feared. Um, you know, before the autumn statement, we were um, perhaps even expecting there to be cuts to government, um, UK government expenditure in the near term. But what actually happened was that they were um, pushed back to later in the parliamentary term, as, as Richard showed. So we have got a couple of years where things aren't as bad as we thought they were going to be, but certainly may get much more challenging beyond that. And if inflation is still um, high, which hopefully by that point it will have calmed down, be even harder. Um, but um, this is where we are at the moment, and this is where we are going into Thursday with a relatively uh, understanding that we will have um, expected flat uh, real terms budget for Scotland next year. But of course, the government um, doesn't just stand still. It does need to spend money. And ideally, when we've got pressures as we do at the moment, um, it needs to spend more money. <laughs> so this was um, this graph shows what the outlook for spending was from back at the uh, resource spending review in May. And we're in quite a unique situation at this budget in that we have these, these recent figures from the resource spending review which broadly outlines what the government expects to be spending um, over the next few years. So here it shows kind of what, what that looks like in, in the near term. So some of the biggest increases, well, as you can see, it looks it stands out quite considerably on this chart, to the social security. And the key things there are from the devolved spending, which um, so devolved benefits, so disability and care benefits with there's some additional spend um, in those items that, that aren't there in the equivalents down south, which the government needs to fund out of their own budget. But the key thing is the introduction of the Scottish child payment. Um, so recently, in fact, that has been increased to £25 per week per eligible child. And that is a huge commitment from the Scottish government and, you know, is, is quite um, substantial in budgetary terms as well. So the implications of that with real-term real spending is pretty much falling across the rest of the portfolios with the exception of health and social care there. And I'll come back and say a little bit more about that at the end because that does partly include the impacts on the, um, of the, the new national care service. So, in terms of what the government can do to raise tax, and there has been a lot of discussion about this in recent days, partly because of a report by the STUC, which um, pointed out that there were a range of ways that the Scottish government can raise revenue from taxation. Um, so where we are at the moment is that um, the UK government has decided uh, at their autumn statement to freeze basic rate um, and the rate for higher rate thresholds and to reduce the threshold at which the additional rate of tax becomes, pay, becomes payable. Now, of course, those decisions only apply to England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So in Scotland, um, the Scottish Government can decide whether to follow suit or not. Um, it does seem likely that they will. There doesn't seem to be too much to gain to by going a different path. And certainly there would be a lot to lose in terms of, um, well, some to lose in terms of revenue. Um, so that's what we um, expect to see come Thursday. Um, of course, there are other options available to the Scottish Government. Um, they don't have the powers over all of the income tax either, so we can't um, change the personal allowance. But they would be able to um, look at some of the other thresholds. Um, 
And actually changing thresholds and rates for some of the other bands probably would raise um, considerably more than just the reducing the top rates, which we think will bring about 12,000 more taxpayers into that top rate band and raise 40 million. An additional 1p on the basic rate, for example, would raise almost 200 million, um, and a, but a more progressive policy to put a penny on the intermediate rate would raise almost 150 million. And of course, those two could be um, implemented in combination as well. And there has been a hint that that will that there may be some increases to particularly to that um, intermediate rate, um, and we'll just have to well intermediate rate and potentially the the top rate as well. And um, we when we wrote the budget report, and this, you know things do move quite quickly. We did think it seemed it was unlikely that there would be much movement there. Um, just because of the the you know a, a lot of households within those tax bands, you know are likely to be struggling right now with, with what's, what's, what's happening in the economy. But it does seem that there's been some consideration being given to it. Um, so we will look, look for interest to see what will happen on Thursday. And of course, there are pressures, particularly public pay settlements, which I'll talk about again at the end, and which you know may mean that they decided their best choice is, is to raise that money to give them that fiscal headroom to deal with the challenges that the year ahead will bring. And I mean, what matters from a budget's perspective is not just how much revenue is raised from taxes and any changes, but actually all, also how these revenues compare to the block grant adjustment. Um, so if devolved tax revenues raise more than the relevant block grant adjustment, it's said that the net, net tax position is positive. That means that the Scottish budget is better off as a result of tax devolution than it would have been had tax devolution not occurred. At the moment, we're actually in the opposite situation where we have a negative tax position, um, mainly because the underlying tax base in the rest of the UK has been increasing faster than it has been in Scotland. Um, we were expecting, if you look back at the May forecast from the SFC, that that position would reverse later on in the parliamentary term because the UK government was set to reduce the basic rate down to 19p, if you remember. But because that has, um, policy has been reversed, um, that situation itself uh, as well may well be reversed. So looking out for what happens to those tax gap um, forecasts will be really interesting um, come Thursday. So what else could the Scottish government do? So council tax, that uh, raises quite a lot of revenue. It's very important for local government funding. Um, so if the government wanted to, say, reduce some of the money going to local government from the, from the settlement, from, um, it could look to say councils can raise council tax by uh, more than they would otherwise have perhaps done so. But we're... Um, same for you, and we'll continue to say that the council tax needs reforms. And before it can be a serious means of raising revenue, it really does need to change so that it's not regressive um, and that it's based on up to date property values. We can't go on now with, <laughs> with property values based on 1990 relative values. Things have just moved so much since then. Um, sorry, sorry, I have a bit of a typo there. Reform's not implantable, implementable, it should have been for the 23-24 budget, but we could start to move towards that reform. It will take a number of years anyway to get the right legislation and to get the revaluation done, um, but it's certainly something we would like to see signal, but we're unlikely to, to get our wish, I think. <laughs> um, alternatively, a non-domestic rate uh, rates are due to be revalued come April 2023. So they have been periodically revalued over the years. And the last one was in 2015. Well, sorry, it was in 2017, but it was based on 2015 values. And now we're having one um, that will be based on April 2022 values. So clearly a lot has changed um, over the past seven years between those valuation dates. Um, and there has been a revaluation uh, done in, in England and Wales as well at the same time, although with a slightly different date set for those values of April 2021, as far as I understand it. Um, in England and Wales, they have, they have uh, produced some aggregate um, statistics saying what the overall change in the tax base has been. And for um, 
the sort of the, the economy as a whole or the, or the business tax base as a whole it's risen by around seven percent um so with a caveat that retail values there have fallen quite considerably and um, so there has been some movement between sectors there um, if we have the same in Scotland, holding all else equal, and um, we should see the poundage rate, which we have up here, um, fall. But inflation, of course, will be have to factored into that. So perhaps it will just be a lower, uh, it's like lower increase than would have otherwise been the case. Or we might see in a, the same approach is taken down south, where they have frozen and the, their equivalent of the business rate poundage um, for 23-24. In principle, additional resources could be raised by reducing the generosity of existing reliefs, such as the business bonus scheme, which we've looked into in quite a lot of detail and, and haven't been able to find that, um, that evidence to really support that spending on the business bonus, small business bonus, but nor were we able to really find evidence to, to say it's having no impact. So it's quite a difficult one to make a call on, but. Um, in practice, anyway, we think the environment that's that's going on at the moment, particularly for small businesses, would make that a very difficult sell politically. So other things to look out for um, just here on the final slide. So, of course, public sector pay, we will um, expect to hear quite a lot about this, um, not just on Thursday, but for, for a while yet. Um, so at the resource spending review back in May, the Scottish government was assuming that the public sector pay bill would remain frozen in cash terms over the period of the spending review. Um, and that didn't seem particularly credible at the time and, and obviously even less so now. Um, but we have, uh, it's been in, it's been in the news so much recently and back a few months ago, you know, a key reason given as to why the, the government couldn't meet the pay demands um, that were um, being put forward was about the fixed nature of the Scottish budget. But of course, the Scottish budget is just is fixed in year. There's very little that they can do to raise revenues in year and, and therefore had to look to where they could cut spending instead. But over financial years, there is flexibility because taxes can be increased um, at the start of the financial year. So definitely one to look out for. Secondly, National care service. So concerns have already been raised by the Finance Committee over the level of cost, but actually more, more importantly, the uncertainty around the cost that may be um, coming uh, Scotland's way as a result of the national care service reforms, somewhere in the region of 500 million per year um, by the end of this parliament, which certainly looks very difficult to reconcile with the spending outlook I showed earlier. And already, there's been some suggestion that there will be potential phasing of introduction of the National Care Service, um, which in the short term will probably mean a big reduction in spend, um, example, for the next financial year compared to what was previously um, built in. And then obviously the other thing that we're very keen on is actually taking a bit of a step back and thinking about the analysis of impact of the, of the whole budget. So we'll often see kind of these ad hoc estimates um, littered through saying this policy will help X amount of people and, you know, will be good for women and, you know, and taking those in isolation, it is helpful. But what we really need is that systematic analysis of what these all mean taken together and what the impact will be on people, but also these priority areas that the Scottish government are setting out on child poverty, net zero and public services. So we'll be looking for the coherence around those issues. And one place to look out for where, you know, often where some of that analysis is done and tries to be brought together is in something called the Equality and Fairer Scotland Budget Report. So that's one to look at as well as the main budget reports when trying to get a sense of what the impact of some of the uh, budget announcements will be. So that's um, me gone all the way through what I wanted to say. And my voice is just about holding out as well, which is good. It's not a good time of year for the Fraser to be getting ill. <laughs> there we go. Um, so um, we have time for questions at the end, and there's certainly quite a lot coming in now. But I'm going to now pass over to Russell. Um, and thanks again, Russell, for joining us. Um, we are really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So um, hand over to you and just, yeah, just let me know when you want the next slide. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Emma. And thanks ever so much for having me here today. So I'm Russell Gunson. I'm Head of Programmes and Practice at the Robertson 
trust. Um, I was just going to, if you pop on a couple of slides, I was just going to really quickly talk you through who we are. So we are one of Scotland's largest independent funders and our focus is on tackling poverty and trauma in Scotland. And we've actually been around for uh, over 60 years, 60 years, yes, uh, sorry, last year. Um, but our new strategy a couple of years back um, sort of increases our size and also increases potentially our prominence in uh, both policy, but also more broadly debates in Scotland. And we invest a minimum over the next three years of 25 million pounds a year um, across charities in uh, charities and voluntary organisations across Scotland. And part of that strategy is also about getting more proactive in terms of what we fund, how we support and our work to influence. And in a way, us being here today is part of that um, more proactive strategy. In terms of um, the next slide, what we were looking to do um, today and what I'll talk you through today is looking at debt and arrears uh, in particular, is in terms of that side of the cost of living emergency. There's been a great deal of really good work from the likes of JRF in Scotland, um, the Financial Fairness Trust, Fraser itself, and loads of others, um, looking at the situation for low-income families in Scotland. But we in particular wanted to look at debt and arrears because it seemed to us to be a place where potentially we could lose a little bit of sight as to what was happening. And also we wanted to look there because our, the, the, our partners were feeding back a great deal that this was an increasing problem for many low-income families. And in particular, one of our partners, Abelauer, um, and their Tayside Family Financial Wellbeing Project. In essence, it's a hardship fund uh, with a great deal of support around it and a new approach to doing that type of work. They were finding the vast majority of families coming for the financial help had actually been toppled over by the public body, usually the council or the school um, that was meant to be there to help them. And so we built on Abelauer's work and Professor Morag Trainer from Harriet Watts, really good work looking at school meals debt, looking at DWP deductions um, to look at debt and arrears in Scotland. And so we commissioned policy support from IPPR Scotland and a 4,000 sample poll from the Diffley Partnership which took place earlier um, last month. And we wanted to look at debt and arrears in general, um, but also debt and arrears to public bodies in particular, to see if we could get a bit of a clue as to what was going on just now. Uh, on to the next slide. Um, what you see is potentially some more surprising and some less surprising, so some findings that are absolutely in keeping with um, some of the other work I mentioned at the start. So pretty consistent across a lot of the work over the last few months is that there's a, a third, in essence, a fifth to a third of very low income families that are struggling um, really significantly. So 29% in financial difficulty versus around a tenth um, for the top 60%. And some evidence that within that, there's particular um, population groups that are struggling the most. So families with a disability, uh, and families with children around a fifth. Um, lone parents, the sample size was a bit too small, but some um, suggestion that um, lone parents in particular are struggling beyond others. Um, and what have, in response to those financial difficulties, what have low income families done? What have those in, in debt and arrears done? So we found that around one fifth, one in five have borrowed from friends and family, this is low income families, to help um, help them through other debts and arrears. So borrowing in order to pay off debts and arrears. And potentially given friends and family, they may well be people that are also struggling through the cost of living emergency as we speak to. Um, you've heard particularly from the UK government, rhetoric at least around the solution uh, to the cost of living crisis being around increased hours or getting back into work. Um, despite some of those stats you saw from both Richard and Emma earlier around our tight labour market. And what you can see is that actually lots of people in debt and arrears on low incomes have already done that, or already tried that. So 7% have gone back to work, 11% have increased work, and 5% have tried but have been unsuccessful to do so in response to their debt and arrears. 
And then some really worrying, maybe um, shocking, but not surprising, in that we see over one in three of low-income families having cut back on food, um, and one in four having skipped meals entirely to save money in response to debt and arrears. And on a day like this, I think it's minus three, as we speak in Edinburgh, where I am, um, three fifths, 60 or 59 percent have not put the heating on when they otherwise would. So you can see that the debt and arrears are having a, a pernicious effect for many people and that many people are having to um, to respond uh, in many quite worrying ways uh, due to them. On to the next slide. Um, and what you can see is in particular looking at debt and arrears to public bodies. So by that, we mean mainly council tax, water charges, school meals, other local authority fees and charges. Um, and the first thing here is that uh, it's much more likely, and maybe this isn't uh, surprising, but it is worth saying because this isn't always the perception that if you're low income, you're much more likely to be in arrears to public bodies. And the vast majority of people in arrears to public bodies are from those lower incomes. So 12% of lowest income in arrears on council tax versus 1% for highest earners. And the story here for those that are in debt and arrears to public bodies is that their circumstances are even worse than those on the lowest incomes. So uh, three fifths of people versus around a third for low income versus around half that for all. Three fifths of those in arrears on council tax are in financial difficulty. Over half have had to cut down on food, again, um, way higher than lowest income. Uh, and around two fifths have skipped meals entirely. And you can see other really worrying trends here where it's cutting down on children's leisure activities, heating, etc., cetera, are much higher, much worse uh, for those in arrears to public bodies than others. And at the same time, through interviews, through um, more face-to-face -face research and FOIs that more like Trainer herself had done, um, there's some evidence of pretty zealous, if not overzealous, collection methods from those same public bodies. So 150,000 third-party deductions were made over the course of 21-22 in the foothills of the cost of living emergency. And some really, uh, you know, I, I do think worrying uh, examples of tiny amounts of debt being chased through the legal route. Um, so £10, we had one example of a school taking £10 worth of school meal debt owed by a low income family through the legal route. It must have cost them far in excess of that um, compared to what they were going to get back. And again, some worrying uh, reports that councils are becoming quite dependent on the £10 surcharge they can attach to bills once they go into arrears. So a pretty worrying um, set of figures and a pretty worrying picture when it comes to debt to public bodies. Uh, on to the next slide, Emma, if that's okay. Um, and so what you can see, the story here is that this is less about can't pay, um, sorry, uh, less about won't pay and more about can't pay. So the vast majority of council tax rates are in lower income. Uh, we're seeing significant hardship amongst those that are in arrears to public bodies over and above those that are on low incomes. And we've got a, pretty much a robbing Peter to pay Paul problem where we know that the low income families that require help are getting it. They're getting some increases through the Scottish child payment. They're incredibly welcome, at least for those that have children. Equally, uh, the UK government has added some support uh, for energy bills. Uh, and it finally increased uh, the UK-wide benefits by inflation, at least from April. But at the same time as providing extra support to those families, what we're finding is that um, those same public bodies, or at least other public bodies, are taking money away. We're also seeing overzealous collection methods. And in general, we're seeing that those public bodies that are meant to be helping us through this cost of living emergency are often the ones that are toppling families over the edge. Um, in terms of the next slide, Emma, if that's all right, um, what can we do on this? So on debt and arrears in particular, what we can see is that there's an option for a moratorium on debt and arrears collection by public bodies, at least until April, 
I, we know the budget is for the next financial year, but there is the opportunity to make announcements that cover the rest of this financial year. This happened through COVID-19 and many of the reports we get informally, but also through the polling uh, and other research confirms that this is a far worse situation than COVID for many low-income families in Scotland. In addition, um, looking at a write-off for more families, there is very little point in firstly charging low-income families that we know can't afford those fees, those taxes, those charges, but then chasing those families through the legal system, only to, in essence, write off a really significant um, chunk of those debts and arrears is an incredibly wasteful, both in terms of money, but in terms of well-being and mental health, an incredibly wasteful system. Um, thirdly, around taking greater numbers of low-income families out of paying council tax, so looking to passport from Universal Credit and the Scottish Child Payment to end that Robin Peter to pay Paul point. Bring in a full water discount scheme. At the moment, the maximum, at least income-based discount for water is just over a third, leaving hundreds of pounds of bills for people that uh, don't pay any kind of tax. And all of that taken together could give us the time to reset so give us time to put in place new minimum standards on debt and arrears uh, to reset this approach. Uh, minimum amounts, uh, duties on timely advice and a single debt process across bodies, uh, public bodies. So if that's debt and arrears on the next uh, slide, I just wanted to very briefly um, touch on the levers and then beyond that, uh, looking beyond debt and arrears. Um, so what are the levers to do uh, what we've just described. So all of them are within the legislative powers devolved to Scotland through council tax um, and others. Uh, and we need to see a shared approach here, a shared responsibility between the Scottish government and local government, rather than one arguing that the other needs to pay um, and one arguing that it's not their problem, but the others. Um, but often this will come down to funding. So certainly council tax reduction, uh, water charge differences would require ongoing funding. Um, and I think the obvious places there, and Emma's touched on some of them, are around itself, and if not reforming it fundamentally just now, albeit that would be a good idea over the medium term. In the short term, we could repeat some of the things, for example, like the ratio changes from a few years ago, that did raise into the hundreds of millions of pounds to do this cost of living measure. So maybe the full reform does take, uh, you know, revaluation and legislation, but there are maybe smaller things that could raise money in a slightly more progressive way, particularly if the revenue is then spent on the lowest income. Um, and I think my final slide, next slide, is looking beyond debt and arrears. Um, so as I said at the start, there's been lots of work, including ours, looking at the situation for low-income families. There have been some really good moves by the Scottish Government on the Scottish Child Payment, but in many ways they get us to now, they get us to here, um, and there may well need to be um, additional uh, work to boost incomes over the nearer term, at least. And after all, debt and arrears are much more likely to be a symptom of a lack of income uh, and of course, the high costs that Richard talked through at the start that people are facing, which even with a wee bit of deflation in a few years' time, are not going to be unwound uh, anytime soon. Um, Scotland has the powers to create new benefits slowly and top up benefits pretty slowly, um, but it can move much more quickly to use discretionary powers or existing devolved routes. And how to pay for this? I saw some questions in. Um, on the back of Richard and Emma's contributions. But income tax is one of the obvious routes. It's the biggest tax devolved to Scotland, followed by council tax and business rates. And I just want to, to flag two UK-wide tax cuts that have happened over the last six months or so. So the one that's a lot more prominent has been the recent health and social care levy being scrapped or reversed. Uh, just last month it kicked in. But in July, there was also the increase in the primary threshold, so the point at which you start paying as an employee um, national insurance. 
both of which are you, national insurance isn't devolved, but you could begin to reverse some of that for some high earners in Scotland through devolved income tax powers. So putting a, a percent or 1.25 percent onto intermediary taxpayers or above, at least as a temporary measure, could be uh, an option over the next couple of years um, to start to pay for some of this. So I'll stop there in terms of low income families in the context you see um, debt in arrears clearly are an increasing problem and there are things that public bodies are doing that are making that worse but over the long term um, it's an income problem that we need to fix um, and looking at how Scotland can raise additional revenues to move even further than it has has to be the route if not for this budget then over the next few. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. That was um, really value, value your contribution there. Um, okay, so we are now moving on to the Q&A. <laughs> so um, we've got some good, a good amount of time, we've got about half an hour to get through some of your questions and we've already had some good ones. So, um, and I'm really pleased to be um, introducing to Q&A Andy King and David Miles, my colleagues uh, Richard from the OBR. So, Hopefully um, you can see us all. Um, uh, David, uh, we might have to change your permissions. <laughs> Just give me a second in order to get your cameras on. Um, so, but the first question that we have, um, sorry, I'm trying to multitask. Um, so uh, David, you should be able to put your camera on shortly. Um, so the first couple of questions are for you, David. So. Um, they are on some of the OBR forecasts. So why did the OBR choose to forecast gas prices towards the bottom on the forecast range? And then secondly, could you explain to a non-economist um, how inflation will fall so sharply in 2024 and in particular how it will end up negative? Okay, let me say a few things on those two uh, questions. When we produce our forecast, we, we use the financial market's implicit forecast of what the future values of gas prices and oil prices will be from futures contracts, contracts that allow people now to fix a price to pay at some point in the future to buy or sell oil, oil and gas. So that's the assumption that we follow, namely that for a central forecast anyway, that's as good a guess as you might have as to what happens to oil and gas prices. And what that would imply is that there's a fairly significant fall in gas prices in particular, less so oil prices, um, some months down the road. It doesn't happen immediately. In fact, um, those futures prices suggest that gas, pr uh, gas prices might go a little bit higher in the first part of next year. But as you move through next year, particularly into 2024, they fall off fairly substantially. That They would still end up way higher for gas anyway than prices were um, this time last year when they were, you know, sort of 40, 50p a therm. Right now we're at three, three pounds, something or other. The projection is that that might drop down to something closer to two pounds a couple of years down the road. So given that one of the main drivers of higher inflation has been the rise in oil and gas prices, if we use those futures curves, that turns around and they become a force driving prices down, a wholly welcome force, I should say. It'll it'll be a very welcome event if uh, consumer price inflation drops down to close to zero. And that is indeed our forecast for what happens during the course of 2024. So the short answer is it's really just a reversal or at least a partial reversal of those big increases in energy prices, which is what has driven inflation up to close to 11. Uh, and we think takes it down to close to zero by the end of 2024 and may even dip negative for a short while after, after that. Uh, and as I say, our assumption is that the best central guess we could make is those futures contracts prices. And that, that's what underlies the central projection on the forecast. Of course, lots of uncertainty around that. If you'd used those financial markets prices a year or so ago, you wouldn't have predicted anything like the level of gas and oil prices you see today, particularly the gas prices. So, you know, it could turn out to be um, 
significantly wrong. It's not obvious, though, in which direction uh, it would be. It's not inconceivable that those energy prices fall even more. Um, we get inflation, instead of being close to zero for a year or so, could be um, more substantially negative. On the other hand, if the prices don't fall back, then inflation is, is going to um, end up perhaps closer to the Bank of England's target and not dip into negative territory. Thanks very much for that. Um, that's a really useful explanation. Um, so next question. Um, so this is quite a good one. So no two recessions are the same. So what differences should businesses, and actually I might, might extend that to, to consumers, um, be expecting for this recession compared to the 2008 financial crisis? Um, so Richard, would you mind starting off on that one? Uh, sure, I'd say also probably a very good one for David. Um, as well, I guess he was at the bank during the last recession. Um, uh, I suppose there are a number of ways in which this one is is different from as uh, well as the questioner implied. No, no recessions are ever ever alike. Um, this one is, I suppose, most like the energy crises that we faced in the nineteen seventies and eighties, which was a period of both rising prices but also falling output and a cost of living squeeze, which we import from the outside world. Um, reducing our living standards, reducing consumption, um, and then requiring uh, yeah, basically a lower level of income and economic activity going forward. So it's a it's a it's a it's a shock to our our, our collective cost of living. Um, the financial crisis was different in the sense that it was a sort of it was a, it was a shock to the financial sector, which then had contagion to the rest of the economy. Um, it was a balance sheet shock. Um, businesses went into the financial crisis with a lot more debt. Um, and then had to had to reduce their balance sheets as a way of trying to get out of that crisis. Whereas we've got into this crisis with lower levels of debt, but the cost of that debt has risen. So it's a kind of it's as much a kind of cost of living squeeze on businesses as it is a cost of living squeeze on households because they are they are paying more to service the debts um, that they have. They're also paying more for the energy that they use. And then the key question uh, going forward is how much does it cost them to continue to employ people? Um, where we assume that there is unlike in the recessions of the 1970s, uh, of the late 70s and 80s, um, less of a kind of feedback between rising prices and rising wages. Um, so businesses uh, are, are allowing for some uh, nominal wage growth, um, but not the kind of full 11% that you're seeing in prices, which means that um, households, uh, the sort of pain is being shared between households and businesses. Um, I think one other thing to say about recent recessions compared to historical recessions is that there seems to be historically recessions in the UK used to lead to high levels of unemployment so people who wanted a job and were look and were looking for work but couldn't find one um, we seem to be more efficient as an as an economy at matching job seekers to jobs but the way this the way both the combination of the pandemic and the energy crisis seems to man manifest itself this time around is people leaving the labor market altogether um, and not even looking for work and either uh, relying on out of work benefits or relying on the savings they built up during the pandemic to support themselves through um, uh, in, in the wake of the pandemic shock, as well as potentially through the, through the energy crisis itself. Yeah, no, absolutely. What's going on in the labour market, I think, is, is particularly interesting um, at the moment. And I know from some of the uh, projections you had around um, welfare spend that there's an uptick in people um, going on to personal independence paper um, payment as well. So um, we'll again, you know, hopefully see some forecasts on that for Scotland on Thursday as well. But certainly it does seem to be different. Um, David, do you want to, to come in here? Uh, just a very brief comment, which is that... Um... Our forecast, the OBL forecast, is, is indeed for recession. We may well be in a technical recession right now. We won't know for a few months. Um, but it's it's a recession which, at least by the standards of the last 50 or 60 years, when we've had some big recessions in the UK, this is you know a relatively shallow recession. Um, we've got GDP falling a little bit each quarter for about five quarters or so for most of next year, 2023. But the overall decline in GDP next year is about one and a half percent GDP falls by. That's not welcome. No, nobody should look forward to that. But as I say, by the standards of past recessions, it's it's relatively mild. And the main reason, I say, two two quick reasons why that turns out to be so, at least on our forecast. Um, 
firstly, it's that the, the big driver down of people's real disposable income begins to reverse. And we talked about that already with the oil and gas prices and, and some other prices of commodities as well. Um, and secondly, something very unusual, we all lived through a couple of years ago, which was a period where the household savings rate was by any measure astronomically high. Uh, and that was really in 2020, 2021, when lockdown was preventing uh, people spending money on some things anyway. Um, and that allowed households, at least in aggregate, clearly not every household, but in aggregate, to build up a bit of a cushion of liquid assets that we expect people will dip into now that real incomes are really being squeezed. And that means that if the savings rate, the overall savings rate for the household sector can fall to quite low levels, that helps cushion consumer spending against what would otherwise be a, be a bigger blow. Thanks. And, and coming to you, Russell, just anything you want to add on that? But I mean, also, we want to just, um, we had a question about um, the ambitions that the Scottish government has particularly around, around eradicating child poverty and, you know, what the impact of rising inflation will be on the ability of the Scottish government to do that. Um, but also, clearly, what is what are people facing um, at the moment and what will the impact be on, on them? Yeah, and I think, so the context for this recession, even if, even if, I mean, no two recessions are the same, this does look more like some of the previous ones to our recent experiences. But this does come on the back of COVID-19, of course, and the, the shock, social and economic they are, but also on the back of 10, 11, 12 years of um, less investment or austerity in terms of public services. So the resilience, so social resilience, but also uh, more broad resilience, um, I guess, is less strong. And that is maybe reflected in, at least pre-COVID, some of the projections for child poverty across the UK were that it would reach pretty unprecedented levels beyond what we saw um, even in the late 80s, early 90s. So we, we're still to see the sort of COVID-19 impacts work their way through. Our, the, the data is quite all over the place. Um, and we probably know that the COVID-19 impact plus this compound into a pretty not positive view for that. Turning to looking ahead, um, so the Scottish Government has 2030 targets. Um, they're getting closer. Um, we're into 2023 in a week or two. Um, and a question, you saw the increases that have happened on Social Security in Scotland in main focused on those targets. Um, so if inflation is eroding the budget overall, um, if we do not see um, income tax in particular, but more broadly tax rates per head in Scotland, at least keep up, if not go faster, which we haven't seen before than the rest of the UK, then the squeeze could be even stronger in Scotland than, than across the rest of the UK. So that means we have to make, we have to cut our cloth somewhere else, or we have to raise taxes in order to fund those targets. So not a positive view, I guess, given you know what we've gone through over the last 15, but also looking ahead over the next eight years. Thanks, Russell. Okay, so we're going um, to have a question now about business rates um, and whether we can clarify what the Scottish Government might do with business rates in Scotland and the likelihood that they will freeze them like the EU, at the UK level. Um, but first, can I come to you, Andy, just um, to clarify what, what is happening with business rates at the UK level? It's a little bit hard to, to understand, <laughs> well, from my perspective, from what's been published and um, what the decisions have been, are, have been made um, down there. Uh, yes, sure. So there was um, a relatively large package of business rates measures uh, affecting uh, England in the autumn statement. So the the starting point was that it's a revaluation year, and because rateable values in aggregate are higher, the uh, what we call the multiplier, what you call the poundage rate, would be reduced. Um, but from that reduced level, it would then rise by 10.1% because of the high outturn inflation rate in September. Um, the government uh, here decided to freeze uh, the rate at the, uh, at the level that it had been last year. So not the one that was reduced due to the revaluation. So uh, it's frozen year on 
Um, and that was at a cost of roughly two billion pounds a year. And that's a permanent uh, giveaway because it's a, a lower level throughout. Um, there's also the transitional reliefs around the revaluation have been uh, changed so that they are no longer fiscally neutral. So as uh, those familiar with the system will know, uh, lower bills are phased in just like higher bills are phased in so that uh, uh, businesses don't see a dramatic change in their bill or rather so the businesses don't see a dramatic rise in their bill and that's essentially paid for by phasing in lower uh, lower bills for this uh, uh, for this revaluation that uh, phasing in of lower bills has been removed so uh, it's not a fiscally neutral revaluation the phasing in of higher bills will happen but the phasing in of lower bills won't and that costs about a billion pounds next year, but then tapers away. And then uh, the third thing was uh, an extension of the uh, discount for retail, hospitality and leisure, uh, which was uh, another couple of billion pounds. Now, uh, within the detail of the, the costings of these is actually the impact on the Scottish block grant. So there's a several hundred million of the cost of these measures is because they have Barnet consequentials. Thanks Andy um, and yeah I mean from in our budget report we do talk a little bit about uh, about these issues that, um, and our expectation which is normally the case mainly because you know there are consequentials so it's quite straightforward for the Scottish government to, to follow through on the same decisions in Scotland and indeed it can be quite politically difficult um, not to but revaluation does throw a bit of a spanner in the works um, in terms of you know actually there will have to be some decisions uh, Scotland specific decisions made depending on what's happened to the tax base in Scotland and um, so we're hoping that we will have quite a, a detailed assessment of that and um, although it is the case that we don't have publicly anyway a, a really good understanding of what revaluation has looked like the new values are out there so you can go and look at them up for individual businesses but I think we'll have to wait till next year until the Scottish government gives us kind of equivalent stats to what we have down south in terms of the overall impact on, on revaluation so there's a quite a lot of jigsaw pieces to pull together and um, hopefully we'll get some um, some good uh, information through on Thursday and what that all means because um, I know many businesses will be keen to know. <laughs> um, okay so we had um, a good question um, on kind of uh, impact um, of the budget so um, based on what I said at the end about it would be good to have a more comprehensive assessment of the cumulative impact of spending decisions and what that might look like. Um, it's a great question. Um, so um, I will start and then I'll pass over to Richard and colleagues to say a bit about what's, um, how this looks at the UK level and whether um, various people are able to do a better job of pulling this together. Um, but certainly, I mean, one thing we're quite keen to be able to do is to pull together um, spending on, on areas. Um, you know, so we often budgets will talk about priority areas and, and um, by all accounts, we're going to have the same this time about net zero, child poverty and public services. But it can be quite hard actually to, to understand what the how that ties into actual allocations of, of budget amounts and what's new spend and what decisions have been made as a result of that prioritisation exercise and, and what decisions weren't made, what, what was put to one side because it's like, no, we need to focus on these priorities. So that's the first thing, getting that, that full um, understanding of what, of what the scale of spending is connected to different objectives. And then the next thing is, is being able to make that assessment of what the impact will be on particular groups um, in the population. Um, Scotland has um, obligations under the Equality Act to look at impact on groups of protected characteristics, but it also has implemented the socioeconomic duty in Scotland, which is not the case um, south of the border, which means they also have to take account of how spending or big policy decisions anyway will impact on people on low incomes. And so there are lots of tools you can use to do that in terms of looking at the um, the the amount of spending being directed towards people, 
but also the impact on, on people as well. Um, and we don't see a lot of that in Scotland other than for kind of bits and pieces. So quite often income tax, there'll be a good um, assessment of what those impacts are in different parts of the population. But there's nothing that really is able at the moment to bring it all together. Um, so that's where we are in Scotland. And I think we, we are seeing improvements with the Equality and Fair Scotland budget statement over time. But I think all would agree we've got some way to go on that before it's a really good assessment. I've seen Russell nodding. Um, but is there anything you want to add there, Russell, before we um, talk about the UK? I think hugely, I think just the gap between the rhetoric that we often hear in Scotland and the budget decisions and more broadly the impact, you know, anything that can begin to close that, I think would be really, really good to see. So nothing to add beyond what you've said. And Richard, um, how does this look at the UK level? Um, is, there, is it easy to get your head around um, what the impacts of these things are? Yeah, I, I guess because um, our legal mandate is limited to being the government's macroeconomic forecaster and fiscal forecaster, the impacts that we look at in terms of how government policy impacts uh, 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 the U UK society more generally is limited to its impact on the economy. So it's important for us to understand how do tax and spending changes affect people's consumption decisions, investment decisions, how do they affect uh, the UK's trade with the outside world. And so and, and we have ways of looking at that. Um, uh, but I guess that, that doesn't get to the heart of the question that a lot of people are answering, which is what is the impact of these public policies on people's more general quality of life, their capabilities um, and, their, and their well-being. And I, I think on both sides of the border, I think both governments have kind of waxed and waned in terms of how they've tried to get, get at the heart of this kind of performance budgeting question. Um, uh, more than a decade ago, the UK had a framework called public service agreements where departmental budgets were linked to, uh, usually with a kind of dotted line rather than an explicit formula, a set of outcome-based performance targets. Um, most of that was gotten rid of in 2010, but the government has made steps to reintroduce some elements of it more recently in Westminster. I think Scotland has, in some ways, is in some ways now gone further down that route than, than the government has in Westminster to, to having a set of policy priorities linking those to a set of outcome-based performance targets. And, and I do think what, one interesting thing, and, and, and I think it's fair to say, David, Andy and I were surprised at how much of a debate there is in Scotland about the GDP deflator and different measures of inflation. Um, and, and I do think one of the reasons for that is that people are trying to get to some understanding of what is the impact of, uh, what is the impact on the kind of, on, on the, what, what is the impact on the volume of government activity, volume of government spending, quality of government spending. And there's only so much you can get from a measure of government inflation to answer that kind of question. If you're asking about the quality of government spending, that also depends on the efficiency of the delivery mechanisms and the amount of activity going on within government ministries. Um, and so, and I think if you want to answer those kind of questions, you do have to go beyond measures of inflation um, and how you adjust nominal spending to get it in real terms. You have to go into basically how much activity is being generated within the public services and then how effective is that activity in influencing public sector outcomes. And I think no government gets this gets this exactly right. Um, and I think there are experiments on both sides of the border. And, and if anything, I'd say the system in Scotland is probably more comprehensive than the one you see south of the border. Thanks, Richard. Um, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I don't think we were expecting to have to care so much about GDP deflation either in the run up to this. Um, budget, but here we are. <laughs> um, so just um, turning to you, Russell, um, I guess we've got a, um, another question about impact, but related to some of the issues you raised in your presentation. So how can we measure the impact um, either on child poverty itself or, or on um, children's well-being, I guess could be another way of thinking about it, on, on the things you were thinking about in terms of reducing, pausing, writing off debts, etc. And this one ties straight into how you measure poverty in a way. So the one of the main poverty measures is based on income uh, after housing costs, to be fair. But other costs such as energy bills just now, you know, more, more broadly inflation don't factor in directly into your child poverty measure. And that's sometimes when you get bad policy. So if we're really, really fixated only on a particular way of measuring uh, child poverty, you may instead of looking at the cost side, look at always boosting the income. So I think you're right, I mean, you'd have to look beyond the child poverty measure into well-being, into prevention of poverty, um, 
into some of the broader things that at, the, at its heart, the child poverty measure is trying to get at, you know, what's the quality of life like for those on the lowest incomes? And the way to measure that, I think, is to look at, um, you know, the levels of, um, you know, look at the, the demand for services that would likely be generated by not doing this, by, you know, chasing down small amounts of debt that then topple people over into other services to help them long term, the scarring effect, look at the attainment gap, look at broader measures that would reflect that well-being. Uh, and of course, ask directly, you know, how are people airing through this? Um, but I think the short answer is that it wouldn't have a direct impact on the child poverty measure per se, but it would have a, an impact on much broader and more important uh, things in terms of people's real uh, experiences on the ground. Thanks, Russell. Um, so we're coming towards the end now. Um, so um, I'm going to finish on a question and, and get everyone to, to give their um, thoughts and I'll come up with an answer as well. <laughs> so um, so where, where do you think the opportunities might be over the next few years for the economy or for, you know, thinking about people, uh, particular policy areas, people's well-being or, or general kind of positive things <laughs> where I used to a lot of doom and gloom at the moment but you know what what are the things we could look out for us on a, a more optimistic note so um I'm going to start with you Richard <laughs> um I, I suppose if if one can see a silver lining um to the uh to the challenges that we face at the moment I, I, I think one is that and it's not I'm afraid it's not particularly original um but it is that higher energy prices are forcing I think an earlier set of discussions and decisions, both about how we can become more energy efficient in the way in which we produce out output, um, and also, but also heat uh, and and power our homes, as well as it will incentivize the search for um, renewable energy sources, which um, would make us less dependent on sort of geopolitical circumstances for our energy supply. So, uh, I mean, in that sense, I think it's accelerated not just a discussion, but also a set of decisions about investments in areas which can make households more energy efficient, businesses more energy efficient, and also diversify our, our energy sources. So we're, we're less vulnerable to these kind of shocks. Mm -hmm. Andy, to you next. I would have said very much the same, but the you know, just building on that, if you look at some of the costs of some of the renewable technologies, they were already moving to you know, parity and below where uh, fossil fuel technology costs were and so accelerating this not only is it good for the you know, would it be good for our efforts to get to net zero but actually it could boost productivity because you could lower the energy cost across the economy so you know there is the potential for something uh, something helpful there which after a decade of uh, less than stellar productivity growth would be nice okay uh, russell welcome to you next yeah, they've, I wish I'd gone first because uh, <laughs> I think um, absolutely. So, you know, looking at the opportunities for net zero and looking at the green growth agenda, also looking at productivity, I suppose just slightly a different angle on that one is that a tighter labour market, you would hope logically would lead to potentially really progressive things within uh, the labour market. So looking at flexible working to get more people back in, to fill jobs, looking at skills investment um, that sit underneath productivity and, and may begin to drive a uh, narrowing of inequality rather than uh, uh, widening of it. And then last thing I'd say is just that, you know, going through shocks like this, compounded by the previous COVID shock, there are opportunities for structural change um, and a, a sort of greater collectivism uh, at the group level, which I think are massive opportunities there for politicians at the UK or Scotland level to reshape Scotland or the UK um, in a direction that might help to deliver on those poverty targets and more broadly uh, tackle inequality. David. Over the last um, 25 years, on average, house prices have gone up significantly faster than people's earnings. So a 25 year old today is, unless they're very lucky, a very uh, wealthy and generous parents, really struggling to find a house to buy. And that's probably true of 35 year olds, not just 25 year olds. One of the good things, one of the few good things that is in our prediction for the economy at the OBR is that house prices fall. 
not catastrophically, but down almost 10% over the next few years at a time when on average people's money wages will be at least going up a bit. And I think that's actually a helpful development because it'll make houses more affordable to young people who in many cities right across the UK, certainly in Scotland as much as much of the UK, have been simply priced out of the market. So this is one of the few good things in the last um, f few years and the next few years will happen that will um, redistribute income toward a generation that's actually had a pretty raw deal. Great. Well, I mean, mine's quite technical and quite analytical, but um, I think what's happening at the moment and, and kind of um, coinciding with a, a kind of a, a real kind of shift in the, the quality of, of debate and analysis in Scotland um, is that we are, you know, having more of these really important discussions about um, how money is spent and thinking about it in 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 the broader in broader terms. And I think partly of what something we've all talked about is kind of the shocks that we've been through the past few years, kind of make are making us think of things in in a, in a bit more of the round. Although I still think we have a long way to go. But you know, really, kind of being able to 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 understand and and have to make these tough decisions actually uh, should lead to better policy making. Okay, well, I would like to thank everyone. I've got a minute over. Uh, apologies for my poor chairing, um, but uh, thank you very much to everyone for for joining, and particular thank you to our panelists. And um, it's been a great event, and we do hope to have an event in the new year in person. <laughs> Um, and we will be in touch with you all about that. Um, but until then, have a good rest of the week. Um, enjoy the budget on Thursday, and then we can all have a lie down after that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.